Hi, everyone, and I want to welcome you today's, to today's webinar. I'm Andrea, your webinar host for Main Street ROI. We are really excited to be kicking off the next round of our Master, Master Your Marketing series. I'm having trouble talking today, <laughs> where we bring together leaders in the digital marketing world to bring you great content focused on ways you can grow your business. This series is sponsored by all of our partners, Active Demand, AdRoll, SpyFu, WooRank, AdThis, Optimizer, and iContact. Whew, that's a big list. Uh, for today's webinar, we are really excited to welcome Sean Leonard, CEO of Active Demand. His presentation is going to be about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we're going to leave 15 minutes at the end for a live Q&A session. Feel free Feel free to type any questions you have into the Q&A box along the way, and we're going to get back to them at the end of the webinar. Uh, yes, 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 today's webinar is going to be recorded, and we're going to send out the replay along with the PDF of our slides to everyone who has registered. So with that, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Sean so he can get started. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And uh thank you all for taking the time to meet with me today and uh yeah hopefully i use your use your time wisely um so today's presentation we're going to be talking about uh, managing uh, messaging consistency in multi-channel marketing strategies and uh, some of the stuff i'm going to be talking about is uh hopefully uh accessible to everybody but i'll also uh, have some stuff for those folks that are advanced marketers uh as well so it's going to be i think it's going to be a, a worthwhile use of your time so today i'll talk about uh, some of the cha challenges we face doing multi-channel marketing strategies uh, and i'll talk about uh, choosing strategies, what is the right uh, uh, right strategy to address some of the risks, and I'll talk about, I'll actually go through a couple of examples specifically. These examples are going to be how we as a company are doing our own uh, multi-channel marketing strategies, so hopefully you'll learn something in, the, in this process. And again, don't forget, uh, don't uh, you can ask questions and we'll have a Q&A at the end of this. So I think that it's uh, one of the things that's very nice today is we have a lot of options from our, as marketers. It's a case that uh, when I was a younger fellow doing marketing, the, the options were, you know, go to a trade show <laughs> or, you know, hand out flyers or something like that. But now with digital marketing, there's a, a lot of uh, advantages and there's lots of options from a marketing perspective, uh, marketing choices that we have. Uh, so it's a case we have a lot of different communication channels, whether it's social, uh, online, SEO, emails. Uh, print is still uh, still a valid strategy in some some segments, uh, et cetera. And one of the things that uh, it's very important to understand, regardless of the channels that you're you're choosing, is that there's going to be multiple touch points. It's a case that, uh, and the story becomes much more complex if we combine mul multiple touch points with a multi-channel marketing strategy. Um, now, I think that uh, uh, taking the approach of, uh, you know, putting bets on a lot of different tables and trying a lot of different things as marketers, uh, there is some advantages to it, but I think it, we're, we, we face some significant challenges as well. Now, I think that no matter what uh, marketing strategy you you choose or which channel you choose, rather, I think that uh, the number one challenge facing all of us, especially in digital marketing, is building trust. Um, it's a case that uh, uh, unlike in the old days when there was a trade show and we had a big booth, you know, we somebody knew someone is going to be spending a lot of money on that booth, the company must be real. Or a brick and mortar store, when you see the building or you see the storefront or you see the, the business, it's there's something tangible there. But when we're doing digital marketing, on the other hand, it's a case that it's very, it's relatively easy to fake it, so to speak. So uh, people are, it is uh, today, people trust nothing, uh, so to speak, and I make that assumption that they, they trust nothing. So as a digital marketer, we need to, we need to build trust. Um, I think the next challenge, and this faces, uh, has faced us all in marketing, is uh, regardless if it's uh, boots on the ground marketing or digital marketing, um, there's trade-offs. Unlimited wants, limited resources, we have to make choices. Uh, and I think it's a case as marketers, we 
all face multiple buyer profiles. If we're only selling to one individual person, once we sold to them, woohoo, our job's done. <laughs> but that is never the case. So there's multiple buyer profiles. And uh, there's lots of different strategies. And uh, uh, quite often it's a case that we're, yeah, usually it's a case we're in a situation where there is only one website. So we have one website and we have limited marketing resources. So uh, it's a case that uh, I know there's 24 hours in the day and if that's not enough, let's work all night. <laughs> that's not really an option. So the reality is there's in any marketing strategy, there's going to be trade-offs. So challenge number three, and this is a big one that we really need to, I think, uh, uh, focus on, is that putting ourselves in the buyer's uh, chair, so to speak, uh, we have to realize it's a journey, not a visit. And then if you were participating in one of the previous webinars, uh, there was lots of talk about, um, you know, last click is dead. Uh, the reality is it isn't just one click to sell. It isn't one click conversion. It isn't a visit. The prospect is going through a journey. Ourselves, when we're buying stuff online or making purchases online, just think about that. No matter how big the product is or how small the product is, we're going to spend a bit of time trying to make the right choice. So uh, as a vendor marketing, it's a case we have to realize that the prospect is, you know, it, it could have been, you know, 80% of their time could have been spent before they actually introduced themselves to you. And uh, the question that we're uh, going to be facing, whether we're doing multiple channel, um, multiple channel marketing or single channel marketing, is how do we maintain a consistent storyline through the multiple touch points uh, the prospect has with us? What is their journey and how does the journey relate to what we, our messaging, et cetera? And we have to, in order to build trust, maintain consistency. So really, the solution to, to accelerating the journey and building trust is really well-targeted messaging at the right time, consistency in the messaging, uh, because if you're changing the message every time that they engage with you, uh, clearly trust is going to be eroded. And so I think it's a case that uh, as, as marketers, we're going, of course, to need to make choices. So really, from a choices perspective, and there's many choices we can do is uh, if we're doing multi-channel marketing, is uh, one, one choice would be to go with the generic messaging. And the second that I'm going to be talking a lot about in this presentation is the concept of adaptive marketing for multi-channel uh, messaging. So if we think about the uh, the first choice, which is you know generic, is uh, it's sort of aiming high, and we're fishing with nets. It's really to focus on um, value statements and remove the 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 buyer out of the story, right? Because it, really the the variance is really the individual. So if we can just focus on, you know, uh, what is the problem that our product or service uh, uh, solves and remove the person out of the story, then it doesn't matter where the person uh, engages with us or how often they come back or whatever the story. It's going to be a consistent story because the person is out of the story. Right now, the uh, the advantages of this uh, this approach are clearly there is consistency right uh, throughout the entire journey, whether it's the first time they've been to your website or first time they read one of your social posts or first time they see one of your ads through to where they're getting closer to building a uh, making a buying decision. The messaging is going to be the same no matter who the person consuming it is. And you, the reality is you're fishing with a very large net, right? Because you know, you've abstracted the person. Uh, the, the person isn't there. So it, if there's a person with that problem, you're addressing them. And it's easy. It's safe. Some of the disadvantages, though, is that you're removing the emotional aspect from the, the conversation. Right. There's no way to really get something to resonate with the prospect. Right. We can't focus on the individual's specific pain points. Right. And we're all everyone on this phone has competitors. Right. And uh, they're all all the competitors are in the same situation where we're trying to buy for limited mar market, uh, limited, limited purchasing dollars. And it's hard to differentiate when you're not personal with uh, with the prospect. So the other uh, other option, and there's multiple options, but the two that I'm focusing on are two 
very different ends, two very different extremes. The other extreme is something I call adaptive marketing. And it's really where we're aligning the messaging with profiles, individual buyer profiles. We're adapting to the buyer's behaviors and we're engaging emotionally with the, each of the individuals at, through the buying process. So what is adaptive marketing? It's really the use of tools to adapt the messaging to the personas and the buyer behaviors. Um, so my background, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, and it's a case that uh, when I was a grad student, I was focusing on something called um, uh, robot vision. And I remember going into my first grad studies co course on robot vision, and it was a very short story here is that uh, I said, you know, oh, yeah, I'm very good at linear algebra. We're going to calculate where things are, understand what they are. And the, the, the prof said to me, you know, said to us as a class is that the reality is people don't think that way. If you think about on your desk, you have a pen, you see the pen, you're not doing calculations to where the pen is. You actually don't know where the pen is. And when your hand moves to pick up the pen, it's adapting to the journey towards picking up the pen. And it finds the pen once your hand actually picks it up. And that's similar analogy to what we're doing with adaptive marketing. We don't know, have to know all the journeys and do all the calculations, but we can adapt to the behaviors when the person's engaging with us. So really, the idea of adaptive marketing is personalized journeys where we, uh, through uh, technology, adapt and provide personal experiences and contextual content as they're walking along the journey. And we dynamically shorten the journey where possible. So the idea being is that when somebody comes to your website or engages with your uh, digital marketing is that if they leave and come back, if we're doing our job correctly, the journey is, of course, shorter. They're not starting from, from the very, very, very uh, first step. So what's involved in this? Well, for starters, we do have to have well-defined buyer profiles or well-established buyer profiles. And uh, we have to be able to describe who these prospects are and what their problems are, what problems they're trying to solve. And then we need tools to adapt the content, our advertising, and our messaging. And the reality is, because it's digital, we are going to have to have a very solid data strategy. So if I, the most important data in this uh, approach is behavioral data. And the types of behavioral data I'm talking about is where the prospect is, where they, how they're, uh, where they are uh, in the journey, how, uh, where they came to your website, how long they spent on your website, what, what they're clicking, how long they engage with specific content, what they talk about on the phone, what they chat about uh, on your live chat, how long it takes them, what they bought in the previous things. These are all things the prospect actually does. Right, so it's not uh, inference based. It is it is inference based, but it's not uh, I would say speculative. It's using what the prospect does to move the journey forward. So from a data perspective, if we think about a funnel, uh, we have our targeted personas, and they're not engaged yet. It's really it is purely speculative. We're saying this is what the buyer looks like. We're we're doing our research and defining who our buyers are, etc. So this data is typically in our uh, our map, or it's in our uh, slide decks, or sp spreadsheets, or something like that. But the important data in this adaptive marketing process is when the prospect actually engaged. So there is inference in this, and it's really, like I said, it's what they're clicking on, what they're looking on, where they are, when they're doing it, uh, what time they are, how long they spend, all of this behavioral data. And then the, the very rich data that is very, that I think is the most accurate is really the direct engagement data. This is when we're talking to people on the phone, they're, uh, they're making comments on posts, they're actually uh, conversing with us. So, uh, and the reality is with a data strategy, all of this data has to flow together so that it increases our accuracy in our adaptive marketing processes. So the reality is we need tools, right? Uh, it's a case we can't just, this is not a process. Yes, we can do it as an individual and we can uh, do this adaptive marketing for an individual ourselves, but it, let's face it, it's not scalable. Uh, 
So what I'm going to be talking about is how we uh, how we scale this process. So really the different types of tools we'll be using, communication tools, advertising tools, tracking tools, and of course reporting tools. And uh, the big part is our brains <laughs> as, as marketers, as we're gonna use our, our intelligence and our experience to help with the process. Now, the challenge we face as marketers is uh, a tool strategy, and there's a lot of different tools out there, and all the tools are very good. Uh, the challenge with a multi-tool approach, though, is that when you are putting together a marketing stack, um, what's missing in the picture is actually, uh, and it's easy to see what's in the picture, but what's missing in this picture is extremely important. What's missing in this picture is the prospect and the prospect journey. The little pieces of the prospect are spread out amongst all of the different tools that you're using and the journey is hidden somewhere in there as well. So really, if you're taking this approach, which is a valid approach, I think that you really need to uh, either simplify the stack or have a very good technology integration strategy so that you can understand or uh, abstract out the journey and the individual uh, prospects. So uh, where to begin? Well, I think that the uh, most important thing in, in an adaptive marketing strategy is to uh, understand the buyer profiles, understanding, understand where the people are engaging with you and uh, take a look at your personalization tool inventory and see what tools you can use and apply uh, pressure to the population to, uh, again, move them along their journey. And of course, analyze what the, what the prospects are doing and then make choices. Uh, and I say that it's very important to build your strategy at the top of the funnel. Let me just go back here. At the top of the funnel, uh, it's funnel shaped for a reason. There's more people at the top than there is at the bottom. A lot of people are doing adaptive strategies while they're directly engaging. But I argue the farther up this chain that you can do your adaptive strategies, the, uh, the bigger the net is and the, more, the better the results are going to be. So instead of uh, me going on and talking about theory, I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change things a little bit and I'm going to walk through a couple of concrete examples of how adaptive marketing works and how we use adaptive marketing to uh, shorten the journey and provide, uh, I guess, a better user experience. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples and the examples are going to be examples that uh, we as a company are, are, are using today to, uh, to, to sell our products. So yes, your companies are different than ours, but I think some of the things that I'll be showing you uh, relate to uh, B2C, B2B, big business, small business, et cetera. You can take away a lot of the things that we're doing. You can take away pieces of them and think about uh, how you can uh, uh, do adaptive marketing. So a, a little bit about us. So before I talk about the marketing strategies, it's important to understand the, the product we're trying to sell in these strategies. So our company, we sell technology. It's a um, uh, integrated marketing platform where uh, the idea being is that we have a full stack of tools that surround the prospect journey and the prospect. So from the first touch of the website all the way through to where the person becomes a brand advocate, our software is tracking everything. And then the tools, social media dissemination tools, email marketing tools, landing pages, appointment scheduling surveys, uh, call tracking, all of these things are, are applying pressure and tracking the individual during the journey. And then we have connections to the advertising platforms, uh, other advertising platforms besides these, but uh, the ones that I'm going to be showing you in adaptive marketing specifically relate to Facebook ads, Google ads, as well as one of the vendors who are doing presentations on this uh, series is AdRoll. So specifically, we do a lot of, we have a lot of different tools, but for this, uh, uh, this presentation in adaptive marketing, I'm going to be using some of Active Demand's tools uh, for the process, specifically our dynamic content system, which I'll describe, and our behavioral segmentation, the connections to the ad platforms, and of course, uh, there is other pieces too for, for tracking and an analysis, bringing the person into the marketing story. Uh, and of course, our, uh, our call tracking, which is going to play a, a very important uh, role in this process. So 
enough about the tech. I'm going to talk about now how, as marketers, we're going to uh, use the, the, the tech to uh, sell the technology, so to speak. So the first example, um, we have multiple mul multiple buyer segments, right? There's multiple verticals we're selling into. And so as a company, we have to identify the verticals that uh, we want to target. And there's several, there's many of them, and I think there's not an infinite number of uh, verticals and buyer personas. And I think that's the same case with everybody on the phone here. There is more than one buyer persona, but it's not a large set of buyer personas. So for us, one of the verticals is marketing agencies. We do sell to marketing agencies. We sell to software as a service companies, small businesses, big businesses. But for this example, I'm gonna show you the process of uh, targeting agencies, for example. So the first thing we do, of course, is the, uh, the speculative data. We do research. We find a large collection of agencies. We upload the domains into the platform. We do data enrichment where we pull uh, metadata that's uh, regularly available publicly, like the logo, the technology that they're using, their revenue size, how big the company is, their employees, this type of stuff. So we pull in this data into the platform. And it isn't just for one company. It's for a large set of companies. Um, and then now we have these companies that we're targeting, we're going to use marketing strategies to, it is a funnel, start from the top and move our way through the process. So the first uh, part of the uh, uh, funnel for us is, you know, signing up for trial, then we'll hopefully get them to book a meeting and see a, a demo of the technology, et cetera. So the, the tools we're going to use, we're going to use contextual content and contextual advertising to uh, adapt or accelerate the buyer process. So if you look at our website, our website is just a WordPress site and it's going to have some generic messaging. And the generic messaging is going to be just like I, I said at the beginning, one of the choices is generic, aim high. We help companies grow no matter what the company, what the, your company is. And then we use dynamic content and the types of dynamic content are inline dynamic content where the website itself adapts. And then we have the ability to do overlays contextually as well. So that means subscriber bars, tool tips, push down bars, all of these types of things. And then what we're going to do is adapt the advertising to the behaviors. So uh, in the example of targeting marketing agencies, so let's say we get this age real fellow who works for this company, Top Draw, to go to our website. At the beginning of the journey, Adriel isn't a client of ours, or he isn't, he's a prospect and he hasn't engaged with us. But if he's on our website, he has engaged with us. So of course, the website's going to inject his logo onto the website. It's gonna pitch this please get your free marketing agency portal. It's gonna position our products to how they relate to a marketing agency in this case. And of course, uh, all of our uh, little tool tips, et cetera, are gonna be pushing the same call to action, which is sign up for a trial. Now, even uh, that we're gonna uh, white label the reports on the website, we're gonna eject his logo. So there's a, a lot of personalization doing here from my, an account-based marketing strategy. So when either it's Adriel who works for this top draw company or it's somebody from another agency, our website will adapt. It'll talk about what we will do, not just for the vertical, for the person. So, so far, we're not doing a lot of behavioral stuff. We're just d taking an intelligent approach to using adaptive content to the vertical. Now I'm going to talk about how we actually use the behaviors to adapt the story. So something that's important here is that if you go to my website, you're going to see something different than in this case, Adriel at the beginning of the marketing uh, buying process sees. So now we're going to bring in advertising and dynamic advertising based on behaviors. So the, the platforms we're going to use is Facebook, AdRoll, and, and Google. And we're going to use in this case, and you can do this manually with spreadsheets, uh, but really the idea here is that we're going to use a feature that some of these ad platforms have. And they Each of them names it a different thing, whether it's uh, custom audiences or CRM matching or any of these types of names that these ad platforms have. But we're going to call it behavioral audiences because we're going to pull behavioral data and adapt the advertising based on the prospect's behaviors. 
So it's a case that, and this is an example, it'll start with a search ad and then it's going to adapt all the way through to a hyper-targeted uh, ad based on behaviors. So we as a company, we have several competitors. We have a landing page tool, so it's fair to say that we compete with landing page vendors. So a common strategy is to target keyword searches for our competitors with ads. So for example, if somebody searches for Unbounce, which is one of our competitors, they see our paid ad. Our paid ad, they click through, it goes to a landing page. The landing page is gonna talk in depth about how much better we are than Unbounce. So now, let's say they search for lead pages, another competitor, same ad shows up. Same ad goes to the exact same page, which structurally adapts to the keyword search and is now talking about our unique compete strategy against lead pages. So we're using this contextual content and we're taking some of the behaviors, which is the keyword search, to adapt the content. So it's still, it's fairly generic though. It's just all we know as marketers, uh, and if you've done remarketing, what we know at this point is the prospect has an interest in landing pages. We know nothing else. It is a, it is a very generic message. Now, if somebody searches and they click the ad and go to the ad, and then instead of filling out the form, they call. So now they're on the phone with our salesperson. And just to re remind everyone, at this point in time, the technology only knows that the person has an interest in landing pages, right? And if you've done retargeting, we could you know, retarget this prospect with, uh, with ads about, you know, in our case, active demand landing pages. So this person here now, he calls, and because Active Demand is a call tracking platform, Active Demand knows this person on the phone is the person on that page right now. So now the person's talking to the salesperson, and he's asking a bunch of questions about our software. Oh, does it do this, does it do that, et cetera. And they say, oh, fantastic. But does it work with my CRM? And the salesperson says, well, gee, what CRM do you have? And they say, well, we're using a company called Pipe drive. Does your software integrate with pipe drive? So active demand not only knows the person on the website, it's also recording the call. It's analyzing the conversation, summarized for our humans, it summarizes the conversation in this tag cloud so I can see it. But the software itself understands that this person talked about pipe drive. So now we have a behavioral audience. We have some behaviors. This person's interests are they need software that integrates with pipe drive. So it's a case that um, because, yes, we do integrate with pipe drive, we can leverage this behavior. So what happens is, is active demand, this is one of our behavioral audiences. It'll adapt the website. All of our website will now reposition itself to how it relates to somebody who has pipe drive. So if this prospect continues browsing or comes back to our website, the website is gonna be talking about active demand and pipe drive. And because we have linkages into the ad platforms, we can now push this prospect into targeted ads. They will start seeing ads about active demand and pipe drive and how they work together. As well as, of course, our email communications are going to be adapted as well. We're going to be bringing in the story of their interest into, uh, into their experience. So they'll see their emails will change, the websites will change, and the advertising changes to get this person to uh, you know, bring, remove the doubt about how well we integrate with Pipedrive. And from a buyer's perspective, now they're thinking, all they're really interested in now is what does the software do as opposed to, gee, I wonder if this really integrates with pipe drive. That's taken off the table. So behavioral targeting is, is possible. Um, like I know if you haven't done retargeting already, uh, the basics of retargeting is really, you know, it's some kind of a, a conversion pixel or you're looking at a specific web page. In the example that I showed you with the, you know, the ad search coming to the landing page, typically with uh, behavioral targeting, you're, you're using them on that page to retarget them with ads. 
right? But what we're doing here is we're adding another layer to it where we're using the behaviors, whether they chat on the chat or they uh, talk on the phone or they click specific emails, click specific ads, any of this stuff, a webinar questions, any of this stuff builds a behavioral profile. We don't need to target all the profiles, but we can take interests and use these interests to shorten the buyer journey. So whether it's the ads that uh, the people see or the emails, the website with the dynamic content, it's really using this person's interests and behaviors to reduce the friction. So it, with going back to Adriel in this case, if um, if Adriel signs up for a trial, the next stage in our buyer journey is we want Adriel, of course, to book a demo. So the website's going to adapt and uh, the pop-ups and overlays are gonna adapt. And of course, he'll now be removed from all of the ad groups that were targeting him uh, to try to get him to sign up for a trial. He's already signed up for a trial. So the ads themselves will now change and they'll say, hey, you should take the next step and book a demo. So we're dynamically moving people in and out of the different ad groups, the content on the website's changing as well as the communications. So the results in this type of a, uh, approach uh, compared to say the generic approach is uh, literally, we've seen a 200% increase in conversion lift, uh, page depth, time on site and conversion rates all significantly impacted as a result of doing adaptive marketing. <clears throat> so uh, really the advantages of this uh, this approach is uh, there's no loss of trust through the multiple touch points. If it's a case that we're targeting software as a service companies, for example, in an ad and they come through our website, our website's going to be aligned with what we do for software as a service companies. And if we get their, their contact information, of course, the communication is going to be related to software as a service companies, value offers, our ads are going to be aligned with that, et cetera. So no matter if they're coming back to us or seeing us, the messaging is going to be consistent. And uh, if we do it right, the messaging will resonate with the individual buyer profiles that we're targeting. And clearly in the results, it's the case that, and if you think about it, uh, if it's done well, it reduces the, the friction. So it will have a positive impact on the conversion rates, time on site, uh, et cetera, because we're giving the prospects more of what they're interested in and, and suppressing that which they're not. And clearly, you know, all of us, when we're buying, it's a case that uh, if you think about anything that we bought online, we, <laughs> whether it's a, a $10 item or a $200 item, we're researching it like it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's going to be a life-changing experience if we buy this uh, phone case versus that phone case. Uh, now think about people buying your products, which are most likely, you know, bigger purchases, the investigation is going to happen. And if we can help these buyers make a buying decision with the right content, they, they, everybody wins. And definitely it has a positive impact on trust. Now the downside is it does require effort, right? It's, it's, a, it's, it's not as simple as the generic approach where we just aim high, take the person out of the picture and focus on just the problem. And it does require a data and technology strategy, right? Whether you have a fantastic uh, integration strategy or you're simplifying the marketing stack with an integrated marketing platform, uh, at the end of the day, it does require a, a data and technology uh, uh, strategy. And uh, the reality is, and I said this at the beginning, it's still going to involve choices. We can't solve all of the buyer profiles problems. Uh, we're we're going to make choices on the high value buyer profiles that we can adapt for. Um, and I think the choices are still uh, still the same. They're different choices, but there's still choices that are involved in the uh, the generic approach as well. Now, from my best practices per, uh, uh, perspective, is that uh, there is a data challenge here. Right, it's uh, there is no doubt, and I talked about the speculative data, the behavioral data, and the uh, direct contact uh, data. We need to be able to feed the data uh, through all of our tools and improve the model. 
right? The better the better we're at getting the data right and the adapt uh, being able to have the data flow the, through the tool set, uh, the better at, at adaptive marketing we're going to be. We we do need to think about uh, um, adapting the, the simplifying the marketing stack uh, and having a technology strategy. And we need to use behavioral content. That's something that a lot of people are not doing today. It's use the behaviors to adapt the journey. Thinking about this hand reaching down to pick up a pen, it's not about calculating the exact location or the exact journey. It's understanding how, what is the adaptive process to getting, the, getting on target. And definitely, uh, the more you can use emotional engagement in your marketing, clearly, the more uh, the closer you are to uh, connecting with the person. And if you're connecting with the person, a buying decision is a lot easier. And definitely, think about what's in it for the prospect. Is uh, you need to be delivering value in the prospect in the in the journey. With my example, the person who had pipe drive, the value we're delivering is we're removing the story. The, I mean, the, the the pain point of I really need something to work with my my sales CRM. Um, and so, in summary, I think that uh, no matter which of your marketing choices, if you're doing a multi-channel approach, uh, definitely trust is a, a big factor that faces us all. There's going to be trade-offs and it's very important to understand that the, it isn't a visit, it's a journey. People are on a journey and you have to, uh, it isn't like I, uh, like the previous webinar that we were on here with uh, the folks at uh, AdRoll and Optimize, uh, Optimize were saying is that it's last click is dead. It's There's a journey in there. So personalize uh, the journey for higher engagement and higher conversion rates. So with that, I, uh, that's really the end of the, the content. I know that was fairly heavy on the content, so I think there's probably a good time to switch things over to talk uh, to, to hand off things off to, for questions. Absolutely, and we have some good questions, so I want to jump in and get those going. Uh, from Clifford, he is asking, isn't the line between behavioral and direct engagement uh, somewhat blurred today? For example, using bots on our website to qualify visitors by asking questions and directing them to specific areas of our website. Yeah, I would say that that is a fair assessment. It's a case that uh, um, yeah, it is definitely being blurred. It's, uh, I think it's a case that uh, um, yeah, and if you're able to use tools to uh, provide value, and I think one of the challenges <clears throat> in all of this is getting it right, right? It's a case that, uh, like example for bots, it's a good example, as well as uh, even with our approaches, uh, it's important to be observing and in, as humans watching to see where the bots are making mistakes or where we as marketers are making mistakes and uh, adapting because uh, the reality is, uh, I don't think that uh, the machines are at a point where they can displace uh, the human from the process. Humans are buying, humans are selling. We need as marketers to uh, to observe the data and uh, make the adjustments. Great. Um, from Karen and also from Dave, there are some questions about um, Adril on the website. Uh, how was Adril driven to the site? Was it via email? And how do you already know Adril's name and logo already? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, in the example I used with, with Adril is at the very beginning, we did our market research. So market research we were targeting in this case was agencies. So with agencies, it's a case that uh, there is a, you know, thousands and thousands of them. And let's say one of them was this company, Topdraw. So with TopDraw, if we've done our research correctly, we know the CEO of TopDraw because it's publicly available. So it's a case that uh, with our data enrichment, we will take the several thousand agencies, for example, in this case, we will uh, pull uh, all of these domains. We'll do data enrichment to pull in their CEO, their the size of the company, the technology they're using, this type of stuff. And that's all automated. And then, so now we know uh, Adriel's, uh, I should say, Top Draw's logo, and we know, uh, for example, Adriel's name. Now, specifically with Adriel, uh, to make the connection between Adriel and the website, there's many different ways. Uh, one way would uh, one way is we get them to go fill out a form. <laughs> you know, that's if somehow we can get Adriel to fill out a form, the website's going to know Adriel. 
Another way is we can send them an email, right? So if we have uh, Adriel's uh, email address, we can send them an email. Uh, all of our emails, whether it's uh, the emails out of Google or Outlook or our marketing emails, if we send him an email, all of the links are encoded. And if Adriel clicks the link and takes him to our website, Active Demand knows it gave that link to Adriel. And when he gets to the website, the website already knows Adriel and it knows Adriel works for TopDraw. We already have TopDraw's logo. We know TopDraw is an agency. So now the website is, is, uh, is, or if he chats, if he comes onto our website just by chance and he starts chatting with our, our, uh, our, um, our staff and the staff says, oh, you know, who am I speaking with? And they say, Adriel, well, we're integrated with chat. We have the session. We have the, the name that we scraped off chat. His, his name is going to show up on the website uh, in the next minute. Hopefully that answered the question. Good. Um, Addis was asking, why does everybody use AdRule? What are the benefits? Yeah, and I think there's lots of choices from an advertising perspective. And I, and, uh, I think that uh, uh, AdRule, Facebook, Google, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. And really, um, my understanding of, uh, of AdRule's pitch, and I'm sure they're, they're doing other presentations, it'd be good to attend and ask them directly. <clears throat> the reason that we use AdRule is um, uh, they do have a retargeting system similar to Facebook where we can push our behavioral audiences automatically into ad roll and Facebook. So it's a case that uh, um, the benefit of using ad roll and Facebook as opposed to Google, they have the same process. Google has the, the ability to do targeted audiences. It's uh, the benefit of ad roll and Facebook over Google for this behavioral targeting is the size of the audience match. Google requires a thousand, ad roll and Facebook require 20 people. So we can do hyper-targeting with ad roll and Facebook uh, with a very small audience set, uh, unlike with Google. So uh, I like I like ad roll and, and Facebook advertising uh, for the retargeting with the behavioral audiences. Hopefully that answers that. Other people will probably have other answers to uh, uh, what's the benefit of ad roll, and I'm sure ad roll has a very good story for it, but that's our that's been our experience with ad roll. Um, Miranda would like to know, on average, how many different behaviors do you utilize to build a behavioral profile? That's an excellent question. And um, really, we actually step back, and like I talked about with the pen, right, picking up a pen. There is an infinite number of ways for my hand to go down to my desk and pick up my pen, right? So what we're, we always start with the end in mind, and we look at the data, uh, and we try to see patterns of success, right? So one of the patterns of success, for example, is the vertical, right? And the sooner we can get uh, the behaviors on the website to uh, identify the individual, uh, the vertical they're in, uh, the, the better we are at adapting the content. So, for example, we will look at how long they spend on specific pages, what ads they clicked when they came into the pages. But the with the end in mind, one of the we're trying to get we're trying to identify very specific verticals. Are they a software as a service company? Are they a agency? Are they a small business? Do they uh, are they a franchise? So it's a case that if we know what we're looking for, then it comes down to okay, which blog post are they spending a lot of time on? Right? Which of the uh, like if somebody goes to our website and they go to the, for example, the the agency portal, uh, sign up for your free agency portal, or are sitting on our agency page, we we make the assumption that they are an agency, and we start slowly adapting the content. But uh, once we, you know, once we get closer to the, further down the funnel uh, for the anonymous individual, as opposed to the targeted account-based marketing, then we are starting to look at, for example, what they talk about on the phone, what they talk about in chat, what they're clicking, how, what pages they're visiting. And we're trying to detect other interests, like, for example, uh, what are their integration needs, this type of stuff. But we're watching everything. That's the reality. But it isn't everything that we use. We, ha we start with the end in mind. We're trying to pick up a pen. What are the behaviors to indicate where that pen is? Um, Phil has asked, uh, he says, this would obviously work great for a company that is selling widgets. I'm a service company, a law firm. How does it work for my type of company? 
It's actually a very good question, and it it isn't just for selling widgets and service uh, uh, and subscriptions and software and that, that type of stuff. If you th and I don't know uh, the law firm uh, as an example, but let's just imagine that the law firm uh, has uh, maybe they're doing you know uh, uh, they maybe they're doing a tax law, maybe they're doing um, uh, accidents, maybe they're doing. Uh, 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 maybe divorce, divorce law, I'm not sure. But each of those are very different buyer profiles, right? And the more, uh, the more, uh, like if I'm coming to your, if I have a, a, a tax problem and all I see on your website is divorce law, <laughs> you know, you're not my lawyer is, is my thinking, right? It's the same thing as uh, if you think about a, um, a resort, right? Let's say we're marketing for a resort. They're not selling widgets. Uh, they're they're selling um, uh, a holiday, right? And you think about their buyer profiles: single males, single females, families, seniors tour groups, and there's probably more. But we just think about that set set of uh, buyer profiles. If I target a single male on Facebook, which I can, and they come through to the website, shouldn't be a lot of pictures of kids, right? Now, myself, I have a family. And if I've got to go digging on that website to find out where the things the kids are going to be doing, <laughs> it's a case that's not the place I'm going to be spending my, my vacation dollars. So it works. It's really about the buyer profiles that really is the important thing. It's not about selling what you're selling. We all have different buyer profiles to target. Um, Karen says, this requires a lot of content. How do you organize it all? Are you using pillar content and topic clusters? Yeah, it's a very good question. And it's back to the, uh, the, the example of a pen, right? Picking up a pen. It's the variance in, it's a, it goes back to the buyer profile, starting the, with the end in, in mind. Like uh, it's a case that uh, for us, we have 2000 pages of content on our website. The 2000 pages of content is not shifting. It's what's overlaid or embedded in the content that's different. So for example, if I know that you are a software as a service company, you just happen to be reading a blog post about, uh, uh, let's say you're reading about email marketing or something like that. Well, on that blog post, there's a lot of area on the screen that we will use to attract the attention of that buyer profile. We do not have an infinite number of buyer profiles. We have a very fixed set of buyer profiles and we have a fixed set of areas in the website. And those areas that we're adapting, if you think about the changes between each of the buyer profiles, we get it right for one and then clone it and clone it and clone it, make small little changes, target the cloning to the stage of the buyer journey and the buyer profile. Um, Ambro has asked, how are you different from Infusionsoft or does your system integrate with it? Yeah, I would say that I don't really, I can't say that uh, I know everything there is to know about a fusion soft there is some overlap in what our tech like at, at the core i think they're a marketing automation platform uh we're definitely a marketing automation platform so there's going to be a, a a lot of overlap there um but as far as uh different how we differentiate ourselves from marketing automation platforms is the adaptive content uh and the adaptive advertising and the fact that we listen to phone calls we what people talk about on the phone what they chat about all of this data active demand is collecting adapt using to adapt the uh the content on the website and i do not think there's another marketing automation vendor out there doing that um trin asks will people who use ad blockers in their browsers see the dynamic content Excellent question. And the answer is absolutely. And the reason being is the the content is the website, right? It, it's the case if they're on our website, the website is HTML. The dynamic content is pull is uh, is uh, created before the page hits the browser. Ad blockers are looking for specific, like for example, links or uh, uh, ads or that type pop-ups, that type of stuff. Whereas we're not using iframes, all of the content that you see on our website is native to the website. There's no way for you to know the difference between a dynamic HTML 
block versus a static one? Because if you look at the source code, it's all just HTML. So the answer is no, it will not, uh, ad blockers will not uh, block the dynamic content because the content is created from the server and it's impossible to differentiate between the static content on the website. Wonderful. Um, that was our last question. So I want to thank you all so much for joining today's webinar and thanks to Sean for this great information. Uh, as a big reminder, we'll be sending out the replay video and PDF of the slides. So look out for that. It'll go to your email. Check spam if you don't see it. Um, and we hope to see you next month for AdRolls Master Your Marketing presentation. Thanks, everyone.